Well, Scott, thanks for for jumping on. Uh, we're super excited to to have you. We've kind of been looking forward to this one for a while. Uh, Scott Paul, he's a, a local here in Utah as well, is is our company. So we're really excited to have you, Scott. Thanks for coming on. Tell yeah. us a little bit about about who you are and and kind of what your background is. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm 40 years old, and I realized that at about 40 that my only real skill is kind of living in the future and trying to bend the rules of uh, nature to uh, make things that don't exist right now uh, that I want to exist, um, exist. So I just make things exist that are not in the system right now because it's really inefficient. And so if I want laundry done, I'm going to find a startup or somebody that's doing laundry. If I want my dishes, I, I, I just, I'm going to go out there and solve all the problems of human inefficiency. And I, and I don't think I'm going to be fast enough to do it because I think AI is coming and they're going to do it for us, whether, <laughs> they, whether they want us here or not. So that is my life. I've, I've started four companies, uh, five companies now. Uh, just a new one just popped out, and then I've invested in about sixty-five companies that are all Holy cow. text, t- mostly tech startups or com- uh, consumer startups that are. Yeah, they most have to have to have tech involved in them for me to be interested because that's where you get your. If they're not, if they're not, if not doing tech, they're they're missing out on like this whole the last fifty years <laughs> the revolution of information. <laughs> <laughs> no. that's awesome uh if you could if you could find a way to find a, a laundry folding machine uh scott i would really like to invest in that because uh, i hate folding laundry and that's one of those human efficiencies that i would like to get rid of personally it's like the I, worst. I thought for a long time it was going to be folding like a machine but um a local company called jury has figured out just the efficiency of having people that would happily do your laundry f- f- all month long for a you know, hundred dollars or whatever. And so you put a bag on your door and then you get it back in 24 hours and it's all folded for you. And it's, it's shut up. Uh, What's it called? <laughs> D-R-E-E. Yeah. Dree now. D-R-E-E now.com. Go try it. This, it'll, it'll blow your is mind. This, is this one of, is, is this one of your startups by chance or no? This is one I'm funding. Like, yeah. yeah this, you're funding. Yeah. This is, I'm the, the first investor to, and I'm going to, I'm going to make sure everyone in Utah uses it because it's, you know, <laughs> it's going to be change your life. There's zero people who like laundry. There's not a person alive. So why not? That's like super true. So kind of going back to like all the inefficient things that you've kind of noticed up to this point, like what like contextually, like in your life made you start to like look for or realize those things, right? Because I'm sure it was just kind of like, was a thing where you, you probably just like woke up one day and were like, man, there's just a ton of tech problems that I can solve. And you probably started solving them. But what is kind of like your journey before that? What made you have success up to this point? A lot of it's just being a futurist, meaning like you get kind of born that way. Like you just, you kind of live, you know, in a, in a future state and you're anxious to be in a state where things work better. And you see, even as a kid or whatever, I just see the inefficiency. I'm not an engineer by nature. I'm not a, uh, I'm not a mathematician. I don't have any of these like really hard skills, but I would just walk through life and realize that the past and the way and the and the things that people have taken and the way things are being done, they're not the only answer. And and that's yeah. that was evident in like elementary school. Like I was I was always in trouble because I just would do things, <laughs> and I just yeah. I just didn't think that there should be one authority, you know, aka a teacher or a parent. Or coach, I didn't think that things should be dictated by one authority. Like if they tell you that's the way it is, my my personality is just to say, no, it's not. Like there's there's <laughs> yeah. 101 ways I can do this, and I will show you. And uh, some of those things were wrong and got me in trouble and suspended, and others were uh, had me voted the most likely to do some something that would make me uh, very wealthy. And uh, luckily, I didn't end yeah. up. Some people thought I'd be in prison, and others thought I would run companies and luckily the latter was uh, <laughs> true although it's you know i'm only 40 so i have 80 years i have 40 more years to we still have get to prison let's see yeah. let's see if you can get yeah. there right <laughs> <laughs> yeah so your, your journey kind of started with well your first significant business i guess was like armor active right would that you say that's first, true? that was my first business that um you know i watched grow and had a team and had an uh-huh. exit that was yeah that was like the first full cycle of a business for sure well tell us just a little bit about like that journey and like really some skills that you had to like gain in order to like take that to exit um no skills 
that was just the uh, thing I guess I learned there is like, it was around this iPad that came out that Apple made. And I just realized like there are behemoths in the world, Apple's at Microsoft's Disney's and they create wakes that are uh, in opportunities. And I realized like, I just got to fall in like the wake, you know, you go wake surfing behind a boat or something. You've seen that, like, that's all I did for the, I wasn't the boat. I was, I just got to get on this little craft, this little board behind that wake that the boat that Apple made by inventing this new category of tablet. And then I was making all these uh, industrial grade tablet covers that you could use in like restaurants and point of sale and conference room scheduling, you know, so I, I just, I just saw the, it's just so clear to me. It was clear to me, actually, this is what's weird is Again, no skill, just this is my human nature. When I first saw the iPhone, in fact, it was the iPad, iPod Touch that I, I remember I got one free with a, a, a Mac that I had purchased in 2008. And I remember when I first saw that iPod Touch, I'm like, well, I, I tell my friend who was working with me, I'm like, this will be one day they'll make it, you know, this big and it will be great for like kiosks and everything. And he, he's, he thought, no, they'll just make like a little receptor that you put the iPod touch in and puts it on a big screen. I'm like, no, I think they'll make like a, a tablet, like this kind of like notebook size workstation. And this is what it'll Wait, do. So you, you had, you had envisioned the iPad before it ever came out. Oh yeah. Like down to the, I mean, it was, to me, it was, they will have the same interface, everything. It will just be bigger. It wasn't that hard to envision. It was just like, yeah. I want this little iPod touch to be this size. And it was two years before they brought it out. So my mind was already awaiting that product and had some use cases of how it could be used in the enterprise the day it came out. So it wasn't a, I'd, I guess I'd already seen that future. So I was just building it. I was, once it came out, I was like, I knew what to do. And I was very quick to the market on this idea of turning that, that multimedia, that Una, you know, it was like an all-in-one Wi-Fi speaker, touch, video interface. I'm like, let's. There's this, this is going to be used all over, you know, while we're in the public, not just at home, but I can see this being all over. And I was right. And at the same time, to this day, the iPad has really suffered being useful outside of like maybe a few point of sale applications and conference room so it went in as, it did its thing where it was for almost you know almost 10 years you know everyone tried to use it like i was uh, originally envisioning but it was a home product it was a product to be used at home and for an education right it never was meant to be a kiosk and so even though i had these grand visions and made some little money i, I i've watched the industry as a whole never really become what i thought it would be they never apple never really said we want these to be used this way and so Today, you'll see a lot of companies start making their own proprietary kiosks for point of sale, for conference room, for kiosk touchscreens, wherever it is. So even though it had this fun run of you know people trying it and, and early adapters, it never really materialized because Apple didn't put the support behind it. And so instead, you know, custom Android devices and stuff became de facto or just the traditional kiosk makers. So I, I got early on in industry. I was there to like help you know, bring a lot of cool ideas to the world that I thought would be ha happening, but it was never, I never built an industry. You know, I was just playing in that wake behind Apple yeah. and which, uh, which, yeah. which isn't a bad thing, right? Like not, not at all. I mean, no, it was life changing for me. Not a bad thing. And, and, uh, but it just taught, I guess I, the lesson was learned. Like there's also risk in writing behind that wake. You're not the wake setter. You don't create that wake. And so you're at the mercy of, the size of that wake and what it does yeah. you're, you're and so i because apple never got behind the industry that i was working in in, an, in a serious way i never materialized and so i would have i would hate to have that be my magnum opus you know and have it cut short because of apple so i you know now i operate differently i try to it's like a cheat code right get your start on something new that you can just kind of ride the wake but eventually for me, at least, I want to create something independent of an Apple or independent of some, a control, the, something that I don't have control of. So how did that translate? Because that was kind of like a, you saw this wake of, of somebody, uh, a problem that was happening and you created a product and you rode that wake. How does that translate to tech? It's kind of a similar mindset, right? You just basically see problems and you're trying to create solutions, right? Is I mean, are you still riding wakes through the tech industry or are you yeah yeah no, in a way, a boat? i mean in a way you know you're always kind of like we're still all kind of riding 
you know, you're building apps. That's, that's basically, thank you, Steve Jobs, that you're mm-hmm. making apps because he created a, a platform that gave life to what Snapchat, Instagram. Every, I mean, who, how many things exist today because we, they're the, and billions and billions of dollars, Ubers, right? Those are all, those are all applications that more or less were given birth to once again, Apple. And there's a reason Apple is the biggest yeah. company in the world and worth $2.2 trillion or whatever it is. But I don't want to be at the mercy of Apple ever again. And so I am trying to explore things that will uh, live independent of, of Apple. And, and I guess a lot of those for me is it's even more risky, but I'm, that's why I live in the blockchain and crypto world for a bit because it's decentralized where Apple is obviously mega and huge and the whole value of apple is more than the entire uh you know cryptos combined their net their market cap mm-hmm. but I, I really believe that decentralized autonomous organizations and and blockchain technology uh, and smart contracts will be a place where you can build and you don't have even governments that can upset you i mean you're completely outside of the realm of there, there's places you can now operate and build and granted, it's not, it's new and it's not like people can, it's, it's, it's got a big marketing issue and there's not th- billions of people there like there is using Apple devices. But the promises that I've seen there and what I think it will do for the future are just too fascinating to ignore. And so that's kind of where I dwell now. I, I get pitched a lot about ideas and if they don't incorporate technology and some type of crypto inside of it or something there, like if they come to me and say, oh, we're a payment tech company, I'm like, great. What are you doing to address what's going to happen over the next 50 years? And if they don't have an answer there, it's like, it's a quick pass because I believe we're going to see something, even though right now there's some total downside of like, there's some real people worried and questioning and the prices are low. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it doesn't, I don't think about pricing. I think about what the value of these, this technology brings. And so that's just a blip in the, in the timeline is the price of these coins. The, tech, the underlying technologies are going to change everything we know. Yeah. No, I I have followed you on LinkedIn and everywhere else. And basically, yeah, we're at the mercy of bigger companies or at the mercy of specific apps. And the more that can be created or, or the more that we can like pass control, the more that we can have control of really the better it becomes kind of thing. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of want to talk about like your three most significant exits in the sense of like, I want to know less about like, the companies themselves and more about how you built the team and like finished off basically. You know, there is, there is, there isn't a huge formula. I wish I could sit here and tell people like approaching, you know, that every day I get someone from Adobe or Vivint or Qualtrics that want to uh, adventure into startup land and like, when should I jump ship? When should I, you know, here's my idea. How, who do I talk to to raise money? If there was a formula to do that, like there was, you know, signing up to go to school and paying a tuition. And you know that in two to three years, you're going to be able to leave with a degree. Then everyone would be doing it. You'd see a lot of exit, mass exit from the uh, workforce. But there is nothing. It's high. It's still to this day, such high risk to build team and then to grow a product and get to some product market fit and then to exit. That I actually, uh, I I'm weary of ever even sharing like or trying to pretend there's there's any course there because it's not built for everybody. It's just I would I would I think if people have the uh, appetite for that risk, they'll they'll just they'll just navigate towards it. And if they don't, they should stay at a, at a job where they might be the most uh, productive and 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 be their best selves. Um, so I don't know if that's the answer, yeah. you're asking, but maybe go a little more. Maybe ask me a little more uh, intricate detail answer because I can give you more specifics. But yeah. overall, I don't. I don't have any big platitudes to like say other than yeah, it's gonna be hard. You're gonna lose a lot of uh, brain cells and possibly relationships and money. And uh, don't do it unless you're unless that excites you. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's totally right. Like I think a lot of founders like come in and think there's like a solid like plan, a roadmap to success. And I don't necessarily think there's like an exact formula or whatever that you can follow, like we said, but I think there are ways that you can set yourself up for success. And I think one of those big ways is by creating a good team. And so there's no way that you could have had, you know, those 
three big exits or what, how many ever exits you had without a solid team. And I think people don't understand the amount of work that goes into building a solid team. So tell us about like, pick, you know, basically one of, one of your companies or one company that had a bit, big exit and tell us about how you went about navigating and building, building those teams. Right. I, I, yeah. Well, and secondly, uh, big exits, uh, you know, Divi just talking to Blake Murray actually two days ago, Divi is a big exit. You know, mm-hmm. you only a few people will experience a billion dollar exit where they're, where they're the founder and retain double digit ownership. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a big, I don't have a big exit. I have, uh, I always refer to my exits as, as base hits. Mm-hmm. Um, still good in Moneyball, you want them, right? You want, you want those yeah. and life changing, but you know, DoorDash and other ones, other people like that's, those are home runs. Those are triples. And so first of all, people need to realize like, when someone says they have an exit, that means very little. Mm-hmm. It could be, it could be. Most founders have exits and some, and might regret not just keeping sometimes, a job. Sometimes we call those exits bankruptcies. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's technically an exit, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's a whole bunch of different types of exits that you, you in retrospect, you might have been working for one hundred thirty thousand dollars a year, to, and, and you know when you when you amortize backwards your your exit price um so base hits still meaningful still multi-million dollar exits but it's still life-changing but they're definitely uh i just want everyone here to really and i have another i'm on another panel today about fundraising and stuff and and next and, and just selling companies and it's and i just want people to know that's like it's very uh you know, it's it's we, we can't just now there, no, i guess there's some notch on my belt for exiting like that that is something that no matter what the size i got to go through the process of of making a deal room diligence negotiation selling flying back and forth to portland being devalued and where i felt like i have more value and looking at my ebitda and stuff so there's all these things that i didn't even think of when i started the company i had no plans to exit i didn't know what it even meant um how it would even happen i got a letter in the mail it was a, like official letter in the mail and i thought it was spam and it was like certified mail. That's what it was. And so no one called me, no one did anything. They just sent certified mail. It's kind of like you would get for like, increase your car warranty type of, you know, mm-hmm. like spam. Yeah. I read it. I'm like, it looks official though. I went and LinkedIn and looked up the website. I'm like, I'm going to at least return the call. And that ended up mm-hmm. being that group. The first one that ever reached out to me that we sold the company to. And uh, it was pretty surreal because again, I had no plans. I had no vision. I, I, didn't, I didn't know what my exit strategy was going to be. But you're right. I had I had a really good team, and back then, this is like 2012. Like this team was, and, and you have to remember too. Like it's only been a decade or so of like everyone has a chance to be an entrepreneur and can go build tech products. Like mm-hmm. Y Combinator is not even 15 years old, from my knowledge. You know these incubators and and the ability to build software in your basement and stuff was not really available until like. I just think it's a very new thing. I mean, the mo- the phones weren't even there wasn't software on phones until like two thousand and eight or nine. I mean, this mm-hmm. is not this is not very long that this has been going on. And so, in two thousand twelve, you know, we were doing apps and building stuff around a mobile device. This is just all new space. We, we had no game plan. We were a bunch of lost boys, and it was like Neverland every day at the office. We had no idea what we we're doing. And I think now people have so there's so many more formulas to follow or or you can listen to podcasts you can go to incubators and accelerators and you can read books and there's a ton out there and i don't know if that helps or hurts because honestly mm-hmm. i just we just had to figure it out and there was and and i think a lot of value just comes from figuring it out for yourself without trying to uh, fit someone else's model for your company and i don't know these other ones i've had more shot i've, I've done several since and they have had um some of the beauty of, of startup is lost when you're just trying to like do the molds that you hear on all these channels and listen to all these podcasts, of how people built this. And you try to do that. I love the early days of startups where you didn't have any information and any feedback loop. And you were just, it was, it's the, it sounds funny, but 10 years ago it was the wild west for that. And now it's, a, there's like almost too much information. Almost the opposite problem exists. Too many people willing to raise your money. There was no VCs when I started doing entrepreneurship. There was like, one called uh, I forget the name of it, V Spring. Huh. Well, and it's super funny that you say that because I very much 
like feel the same way like I don't like reading books like I don't love listening to podcasts and I don't like google a lot of like questions to like these random business problems that we have I definitely just kind of like ride the wave try to navigate as best I can make some judgment calls here and there and really that it's it, like no matter what like everybody's situation or context is going to be different and you just have to figure it out for yourself so it's yeah. it's kind of fun to hear you say that mainly because I can relate to that in a strong way yeah. like I hate taking advice I, I rarely <laughs> ever ask for advice <laughs> I don't know it's just kind of funny <laughs> no, I mean, that's a that's a true sign of that you're you're probably a natural born entrepreneur because if you like things formulaic and 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 laid out for you you're going to be at Qualtrics right now you know somewhere middle management or some other company or some safe you know government job that's just the that's just the nature of it that's more comfortable for for certain people and there's nothing wrong with that i have brothers that are like that they they would much prefer a roadmap ahead of them and know what they're going to do for the next five years and i yeah. and, and that same thing for me is the opposite. If I know what's going to happen in even a month, I get anxiety. Like, oh no, yeah. everything's spelled out. I'm on a determined pathway that has is all predictable, and I need out. So I, I can't. I want the opposite of predictable. I want the unpredictable. I I, I overemphasize and over index and over. Uh, I, I, go, I I make my life as unpredictable as possible to my wife's dismay. Well, and it's funny because a lot of people can't live like that. A lot of people can't can't handle the not knowing that they're going to have a job in two months, right? Like that that's that's a different mindset. It's actually funny because I think you and Austin had very similar childhoods. Uh, cause yeah. you know, I feel like Austin was a bit of a, tri a trouble child as well. And, yeah. and he had two ways to go, whether it was prison or really successful. So hopefully we're <laughs> riding the other one, but what I, I'm, I'm really interested, Scott, cause you, you went from more of like a, a hardware product to tech, what really drove you to tech and how was your experience when you first got into tech? What That was probably pretty early on in the Wild West, right? Yeah, I got into tech because I was um, convinced I needed to build a mobile app to become, I, I wanted to have something in Utah. We, we Here in Utah, we have, even to this day, we don't have any consumer companies for the most part. There's no household names. There's no, we don't have our campus full of Snapchat alum or Facebook. We don't have... That we don't have those paper. We don't have it. It's just we're, we're a SaaS. We're a SaaS city, and SaaS is worth a lot, and it does great stuff for the world. But it's frankly, it's boring as hell. I mean, there's just nothing really interesting about a SaaS company. That and 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 so, for me at least, like it doesn't. You don't have Nikes or Disney's the, the equivalents in SaaS. Like everyone maybe has heard about Oracle because they named like a field or something, but nobody knows what Oracle. No, the layperson in the world doesn't know or care about Oracle or their branding or Salesforce for that matter. It's not even, they're not flashy, right? They're business to business and businesses for the traditionally business has been a very boring, they do boring things. They're, they're very afraid of, of, of culture and being themselves and, and being human. They're just, we have this thing here that you have to, and it, I don't know what it is. I mean, my brother's just left uh, Exxon Mobil to come work here for Qualtrics and MX. And it's just like, I, I, so I hear all their stories of what it's like to be in these kind of B2B worlds. And even though Exxon Mobil's, you know, has consumer oil, but it's still very much a B2B. Most of their revenues are selling, um, to, you know, refining, refining and all that and stuff and discovery. So I, I just, I get really bored about, uh, about these companies. And I think if I'm bored, I think a lot of people like me and they're bored too, like, Let's either change SaaS businesses to make them fun and make them approachable and human to the lay people, and or let's build a SaaS, let's build a consumer company here in Utah. Let's build our Airbnb or our Zillow or what? Who knows what? It, I don't care. Our Nike, our anything. We have nothing, and people argue. With me on this. Well, it's so it's so funny that you say that, mainly because like we're to the point. I feel like as a development studio, where like we only want to take on exciting products. Like there are very few months where we will go and not get pitched the exact same thing, like three or four times in a single month, right? Like everybody's building the same thing. Nobody's trying to really innovate. They think they are, but they're, they're really not mainly because it's like the fourth time that I've heard their idea. And, and so it's kind of interesting that you say that, right? Like it is just like a Utah thing. It's just SaaS. It's just yeah. it, that's everybody talks about just SaaS yeah. here. And it was so. a lot of the fundraising goes into SaaS, and a lot of the billionaires made their money yeah. from 
costs. And so it's just, it's a repeated, it's a repeat cycle. And when you have yeah. PayPal as a success and it sells to eBay and it's a consumer thing, and then those guys go on to make the next consumer things. Chad Hurley when yeah. they made YouTube and Peter Thiel and Elon Musk, all, all they're doing there. I mean, I can't, I can't remember how many companies came out of PayPal mafia, but it's insane and they're all massive. And, and so we just don't have that. We need to have somebody create a SaaS, uh, sorry, a consumer company and then have a massive exit, keep it here, you know, go public, whatever, so keep it in Utah and then go fund the next generation of, of consumer products. It's not Overstock and it's not Ancestry. I'm sorry. Those aren't it guys. And, I, and a post on LinkedIn made it very clear that we don't have one because I posed mm-hmm. this question and all the responses were like Domo and stuff. I'm like, you, you go to Baltimore in the streets and ask how many people know what Domo is and you'll get zero. Qualtrics, I mean, maybe I, one, maybe one yeah. person. It's like I live here and I still don't really know what Domo does. I, I hear the name all the time and I know they're big, but I have no idea what they do. So exactly. that's kind of funny. Do you think that's a big reason why you started getting into investment or angel investment? For that, it starts. It was the reason I tried to do that app called Voto. I tried to make a consumer uh-huh. mobile app. And I went and tried to make a new an app that it was kind of like an Instagram competitor at the time. It was 2012. It didn't work. Well, it actually worked. I figured out how to get a lot of users, but I did not figure out how to monetize it. But that app became what Disney bought, essentially, was we learned how to acquire users using influencers in 2012. And Disney ended up buying our marketing agency. So I gave up on my like ambition to have a huge mobile uh, app. But at one time, I was ranked nine, right next to Twitter and right next to Vine. So I, I, I got millions of users and felt pretty accomplished, but didn't figure out how to monetize that thing at all. So mm-hmm. uh, here I am. What's, trying to, what's that? Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, tell us like about that. Because I feel like social or really like, I think if you're providing like a service B2C, I would say that is easier than trying to build like a social platform and, and getting users into it. Right. And if your main focus is trying to really go like B to C, what advice do you have for those people who are building those either service products or those new social apps? And what are some of the trends that you're seeing to acquire users? Because I imagine you're probably investing in a a lot of companies that may try to be solving this problem. Oh, Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's where I put most of my money is in consumer mobile, not quite social networks like I was trying to do, but, you know, the free play neighbor you know, I like marketplaces. I like the idea that a marketplace could come here in Utah, you know, our own version of an Uber or an Airbnb. Uh, neighbor might be our closest one that we have going for us. There's a few more popping up. Homie, I was just talking to Johnny Hanna, the founder of Homie. Homie had ambitions when they started, and it's been a very hard road for them to do what they wanted to do for real estate uh, transactions. In fact, they've had to like readjust a lot to the point where it's not quite the disruptive technology that it could have been and saving people a ton of commissions. Like he was literally this morning, he was using an app, but we, we have this app called volley that's been started here in Utah yeah. that we all use. And yeah. I'm an investor in that one because I love what it can do for communications, but we were both using this app to talk and he was sharing with me 10 minutes of how hard homie's been and, and they're still very successful, but, mm-hmm. but it's, been very hard for him to keep his vision of what he wanted it to do for people because people continue to just hire their friends, family, and brother-in-laws or you know high school friends mm-hmm. at the cost of four, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars to sell their home, mm-hmm. and, and then yeah. it's just like, what? Who do you like that much that you would do that? It's super interesting that you mentioned homie only because like I have a buddy who's in real estate who has some strong feelings, but it's interesting because that means I've started to pay attention to like their marketing, and I feel over the last like nine months, they've made a huge pivot because of all of the the pushback. Um, and so that's just been interesting because I have personally been watching that um, yeah. and all the billboards and all of their content change. So it's Dude, that, interesting. That billboard right at the point of the mountain, I read it yesterday and it was uh, how to make a hundred thousand download homie, sell to a Californian. And I'm like, that's so <laughs> true. That's so good. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, it's funny because you, you did talk about Gab. Uh, didn't Taysom Hill just invest in Gab with you guys as well? Yeah, Taysom and this group called Sandlot Ventures, which is a bunch of just some of the tech bros in town, <laughs> to be honest. But yeah, they're good people. They just, <laughs> they just did a, a round in Gab. And Gab's doing great. Um, it's a hard one. You know, that's a interesting that's model. A yeah, to go after a telecom. That's a huge like thing to try and solve. 
Yeah. Yeah. He's passionate to Stephen Dalby, the founder. Um, you know, my wife and I cut him his first check because we, we just believed in the problem having the teenage girls. And I I worked at Disney for a while and saw the in, in, inner beast of kind of the dark side of social media and, you know, yeah, yeah. and content and, and just addiction to these cell phones and chat, ch mm -hmm. you know, means on these random anonymous chat apps. And I just, I've seen it all. And, but you know what? It cannot hurt to have your kids not be on social media, even though yeah, I love yeah. it and use it and uh, have made a business yeah. around it many times. What really kind of drove you to the whole angel route, right? Because you started with that, right? You started after you had a few different exits, you probably had like capital and then you became an angel investor. Is that kind yeah, of how it was, that it was after Armor Active sold? I, I put together, it was only a quarter million dollars, which you know, may sound a lot. And it was a lot back then for me. It still is, but it was uh, very small when it comes to an amount that you would start a fund for. Like that's yep. that, that's usually like a check that one angel would write. Well, I try. I wanted to fund ten companies with that. Like I wanted to really see how much I could do with two hundred fifty thousand and some friends. I had some friends join me and like said, "You guys don't have to put any money in, but help me go pick and select startups." And so we did like a pitch contest. We called it hyperactive capital mm. and we did a, uh, uh, cause we were armor active and I'm hyperactive. So we just called it hyperactive capital and we made um, a little website that had a pitch contest and I made just horrible bets. Like I, the reason I wanted to do it was I had so many ideas and I knew I couldn't build them all. So I'm like, and so it just made it natural that like, here's my way to get involved is, yeah. is be a part of the story is by just putting, cutting him a check. And then I get to kind of, kind of get to place a lot of chips on the table versus it just being the one thing that I'm involved in, you know, whatever startup I'm building. And truthfully, the first three years, I just had no idea what I was doing. I had no thesis. I had no discipline. I mean, I gave $100,000. My first check, I was $100,000 to a ski clothing company. I mean, it's just, it's just, that's not what you do. And it, and it's just, not, it's like anyone would tell you, like, I'm in Utah, do tech, don't do a lifestyle brand. Like, that's just not mm -hmm. what that's just like, yeah but you love skiing right as long as you I don't love, break your I leg love skiing and i love this founder and i loved everything about like you know but it's just the wrong amount of money to do the deal wasn't great and and i lost mm -hmm. yeah i lost i lost everything i didn't i didn't i didn't give a dime i i wrote that one off this year actually and it was one hundred six thousand dollars i gave to the to this group and uh and that hurts and and i wrote off the next like three deals too just recently and so like people think, you know, oh, angel investing or like, yeah, it'd be fun if I could do that. Like it is, it is most likely you're kind of just charity work that you're donating. So the only thing in retrospect I've been doing for seven and a half years or whatever, the only thing I realize in retrospect is I have one in angel space because I, I kept playing. And if I were to drop out in the first two, three years, it would have been the worst investment. Like that part of my investing uh, portfolio had been horrible. But then I stuck around. And I just kept giving checks to every great idea that came across my desk that I felt was a great idea. And that's when I got into things like Prenda and Neighbor and Know Me yeah. Health and Bali and a few out in LA called Donut Media and Wave TV. And, and these have already gone through Series A. And my puny little check, I've had one of those puny little checks almost 85x, right? And so... Oh my God. One of the 60 bets paid for all of them. And that is basically venture investing. That is why you do it. But had I dropped out early and, and felt like I had risked too much, I would have, I would have lost everything. And the same thing is kind of with crypto. Like crypto is the same thing. I got in, I had to ride the waves and I stayed, I held, you know, I just keep, I keep buying and I keep betting and I keep believing and it keeps paying off. And right now it's at a low, but it's going to go crazy. And and it's just, that's just the nature. That's I've been in these cycles long enough to know that this is just how everything goes. And you have to stay in the game. You have to hold, you have to keep making bets. You got to stay up on things and it'll, it'll pay off. And I, and I know that I'm, I have a YouTube channel now that I do, and our goal is to get $2 billion so that we can give most of it back. But we want to show everyone the journey of how we go towards creating $2 billion of wealth via startups and crypto and that's crazy to even think that that's possible but it's first of all you manifest something and secondly like this is the only time in the history of the world where an idiot like myself can potentially go and and find two billion dollars of uh value in in the in the bets and the companies i start and, ra and raise for and so 
uh, it's, it's just that's the unique world we're in today. This has never been this is unprecedented times. It's a great time to go out there and, and risk because technology is allowing people to upset industries that have been around for 150 years with a little kid in a basement and knowing how to code on iOS. And that's beautiful. Yeah. So, and, and I'm sure you've like learned a ton up to this point, like through your seven years of, you know, funding startups, what are some things that you look for when you're investing and what are some red flags you typically see with these companies? Yeah, I think, well, I think you guys see it too. So you have, you know, your dev shop and the first company I tried to build my product with was a dev shop down St. George. He now runs my product uh, at Wooly, one of my software companies. So ironically, the one company I've been CEO of for the last five years is a SaaS company. It's the, I, I don't invest <laughs> in SaaS companies. I don't get involved with them. Uh-huh. I, have, I just get, they just, even though they're very profitable, they just give me the willy nillies now. I just don't, I just, yeah. And yet you're the CEO of it. So that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to be, I actually hired a SaaS, a CEO you that just, was good at sales and SaaS. I don't like yeah, these. You apps. just, I, what's that? That was only in like a couple of months ago that you just stepped down, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, truthfully, I don't like companies that have to be sold. I don't like a product that you have to hire a massive sales team to go out and push, whether it be pest control or anything or MLMs or SaaS. I, I believe the best things in the world are so obvious that you are begging to use them. You, you, you know, Coinbase doesn't have to go around and like convince people that they should be making money, right? Or Uber, you know, I mean, they have their little referral programs, but like, and they have to have marketing, but I just don't like the, I don't like when you have to put a human being out on the street to make the phone calls and to do the sell. I just think that's, I don't know. And I came from sales. So I just, I just have this, I just, I don't love that part as much. And so I try to avoid companies truthfully that have to go out and build massive sales teams. Cause that is, and that is a, that is a gift that is with all the missionaries in Utah, it's missionaries. That is something that we, that we're really good at. And that's why you have MLM, SAS and, and pest control and, and smart home and Vivian solar cells. Like, right. We have that here because it's in the DNA of the culture. Mm-hmm. I just personally don't think that's a, it, it might be a competitive advantage. I think I'd much rather build a product that's pulled into the market that it's so good. Well, it's just it's, pulled. it's product market fit, right? Like if it has such good product market fit. So I worked at Divi and I'd yeah. say Divi is a pretty good example. Like it, it was free. It didn't cost anything for the person yeah. and it brought a ton of value. Yep. So you don't, you don't need a, a heavy sales force or even a good sales force or even a good marketing because the product market fit is so yeah. good. Whereas I worked at another company that they had to force it down people's throats and the product wasn't, the fit wasn't there and, and they yep. had massive layoffs, right? Yep. So you're telling me that these green flags and these red flags are really product market fit. If it makes sense, and you don't have to force it down anybody's throat. It makes sense to like, okay, I will continue to listen. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, yeah, let's let's not throw out baby with bathroom. There, there, there are sales companies that are incredible, and oh, yeah. I would have made a sick amount of cash that I put my money into. Let's say Divi or you know some of these others. I, it would have been great. So, or but Div, yeah, and Divi's Divi's an interesting one because that's SaaS, but it's quite different. Um, not even SaaS. I don't think that is. I don't know. I don't know what to yeah. categorize. That's fintech, right? So I think the biggest red flag, though, is that when you guys get pitched an idea from a business person or some idea person on, I want to use your dev shop to build this mobile app because it's such a good idea. And then my sister and my mom said it's a good idea. And I've got this money because I just, you know, my, my husband has a great job or my wife has a great job and we want to put it towards building an app. Like there's 101 warning signs on that. Like, you you will mo- and my friend run, run, runs a company called Rocket Made and he took he took thousands of those pitches over seven years and they never materialized. Even mine was that pitch. You build the product and before you know it, like they're out of money or but they never go in to become. In few cases, they might go in to become you know go through a series of rounds. But even if they do, what's your best chance? Your best your best outcome as a dev shop is they they go build an internal team and cut you out. So like dev shops are in this really tricky situation where their failure and their success kind of cuts you out of the system. And so uh, I, I, I do kind of try to think about your situation, how you would have to listen to these people. But the, the har- hardest part, the biggest red flags is people have ideas, but the, it's not, the idea is nothing, it's zero. They think their idea is precious. It is so much about do they have, um, do they have unfair advantage on their acquisition? Can they make noise and build a community and something with and have an unfair advantage and to do that? And and if they do, and you match that up with a good idea, and then do they have good leadership and team building? I, I'd get behind something like that. 
Now the other risk is, are they going to actually hire you? Like maybe for a little bit, but like the truth is that if they're successful, every investor and every um, VC wants to see an internal team, you know, like is the team, is the DevOps and the, and the brains own, you know, it can be, you know, like we have some people in Ukraine doing it, but like, it's really important raising money. I failed at raising money because I'd outsourced the very thing that we were, we were technology and it wasn't my, it was being built by a very expensive firm. And I shouldn't go too deep on this, but po- point I guess I'm saying is if they have those things present, uh, if they have an unfair advantage on acquisition, if they have team, like if they know how to unite and build and get good people around the table that are experts, and, and then the idea is mildly decent, then I think uh, I would invest. And I mostly only invest in people who are have a really crazy idea and, and some track record and are uh, that, that the, the deal is coming to me because I'm uniquely in a position to hear about it early on. I don't want a deal that's broadcasted to the world like, hey, we're raising and anybody that has $20 can help us get funded, you know, kind of like the Harmon Brothers do with their VidAngel stuff or whatever. I don't, I don't like mass advertised investment opportunities because I feel like if you're investing and everyone else has an equal opportunity to invest, it's probably overpriced and probably it, it doesn't make, it just doesn't make me feel special. I want to be the first, like I yep. want the Gab experience. I want to be the first person that gives him money and believes him in and believes him in and has that. Um, and I get, usually when you do that, you get a advantage on the valuation and you get to help them grow and you get to introduce them to the next investor. So I want deals that come to me uniquely, not, not, not massively broadcast. So it's, it sounds weird, but all the best deals I've ever had were just that they, 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 they came to uh, you. Yeah. I, I, had, I had done the work over the last seven, eight years broadcasting that I'm a unique angel investor with this thesis and I want deals that look like this and I take serious chances and you don't have to have product ready or even revenue. I just want to invest in crazy people. And that attracted, that got me introductions to, to opportunities that didn't even, the company, the brand, the things didn't even have names, the, the companies I invested. So you, what you're telling me is uh, you're not one to jump on Kickstarter and, and fund those companies very often. <laughs> you, you, you really kind of like the, the really early adopting is what really brings passion to you and makes you feel like you're starting something with somebody. Yeah, that's that's probably it. I want to be among a few people behind the deal. Like I don't want it to be this a thousand, a thousand people are on the cap table. So yeah, that's that's a good way to say it. Yeah. So, so I'm I'm really curious, Scott, I kind of want to hear a story because I feel like you just have just like a huge wealth of just experiences with different businesses, different companies, different investments. I'm really curious about like a, like a really funny experience of something that happened that was like, is this really happening right now? Do you have any of those like experiences in all of these different businesses you've started? Um, to me, everything's funny. Like life just makes me laugh because it's so, so serendipitous. But I will just say because of my LinkedIn antics, at, what do you call that? My the character I play on LinkedIn and you know, I wear right now I go around and I wear wigs all the time. And like, I'm going to this crazy Utah business panel today to talk with all the VCs. And I'm just on there as the YouTuber investor and I'll have long hair and I'll probably wear a dress. I don't know what I'll do, but I don't, I don't, I'm always in character because I'm so sick. I'm so sick of like seven white males lined up behind the panel. And I'm just like, this is just, we need to just, and I just want to be the purple cow. Not, and not because I need attention. I do need attention. But secondly, <laughs> if I'm not going to do it, who's going to go do that? Because we can't sit here and have panel after panel that's just so damn boring. There are ADHD people in the crowd like me or my daughter who will only be attracted to the space and want to go build stuff if they realize they can be their crazy selves when they're at doing it. And they don't have to be all you know dressed up in the, in the same in the, in, the, in the same attire trying to talk and walk like the rest of the, the, the crowd. And so I, I'm, I'm here to, I, every day for me is hilarious. I, every day for me, I have these moments that are just, that shock people or shock me, make people laugh. And truthfully, that's just led to some of the crazier opportunities. I, I, I'm now working with Dude Perfect, which is a huge YouTuber on this VR experience that we're doing. And that whole that whole relationship and the way I got to Texas to meet them and, and, and got them involved came through uh, an individual who 
thought I was a homeless at, at Pioneer Park. He, I, I was, I came up to him and said, Hey, can I hand with you guys? And they, he offered me money, but he didn't realize I just wanted to uh, hang out for a bit. Cause I was down Salt Lake and, and, and we just come out of like this conference and, and just, but I was dressed in black with long hair and Pioneer Park's where a lot of the homeless people hang out. So he, he offered me money and I said, no, I just want to eat with you guys. So he's like, okay, let's get, buy this homeless guy some food. And, <laughs> and his group of friends that what he was with became some of my closest friends and now are like investors alongside me and everything. But the, we just laugh. I have it on video. We laugh and laugh about the fact that we came together at, at his, as his offering me food and money so that I could get, you know, get back up on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's so ex- funny. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a true weird Dude, story. That- and those, and those happen, those just happen so frequently lately that I don't even, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's just that's a that's a daily occurrence for you. Yeah, tonight it'll happen tonight. It'll happen tonight. There'll be something that happens tonight. Mm-hmm. And I you know I get kicked off LinkedIn all the time for being an idiot, and that's why I started the YouTube channel because I thought maybe I won't get kicked off as easy. But we'll see. I, it's if I'm not like in danger of getting called out or getting cooked off a network every single day, then I'm I don't feel alive. And so I'm, maybe I'm addicted to adrenaline or you know that's the night. You know, some people like heroin. I like I like pushing it on the edge of like social media and and business conferences. So that's just my kick. <laughs> my hit. <laughs> that's super funny. Uh, I I I just think that's like hilarious. Like it's I love that everything is just like so against the grain, and it's so fun to see that you like have the energy for it. Because it, it, it's kind of funny because I was talking with somebody the other day, and like they get so bogged down by going against the grain. But it's like so what they believe in. But like some people have the energy for it and some people don't. And it's super I'm like super pumped to see that you've got the energy to go out and like do this and be so against the grain and be like opposite. And it's got to be refreshing for just like a lot of people to like watch and be a part of. And so that's super cool. I get all the CEOs like Davis from Cotopaxi, Jeremy from uh, Traeger, Johnny. They'll message me and they're like. Scott, keep it up, man. You crack me up. You're my favorite. <laughs> so it's like these people that I should be afraid of, like maybe offending or you know, they're very, they're the, they're the local, they're, you know, they're religious and they, yeah. they're not, they're not, they're just, they're the type that you would think they're the ones that I'd be worried about there. Like these are some of the people that I'd be worried about. What do they think of my antics? And yet they're going out and out of their way supporting me and like telling me like, keep it up. You, you crack me up. And so I've only been met with like the opposite of what you would expect from acting yeah. out actually and being a, and being a, a troublemaker. It's like, it's like they're doing articles on me in papers now. Like there's Utah business magazine has this crazy photo of me and, and all, and people loved it. I thought it was going to get me like canceled. And so like the, I keep getting the wrong signal, I guess. And I, so I keep acting out. <laughs> yeah. That's super oh funny. My gosh. What's the most challenging part you think thus far about building a business and like right now? Like probably the, the uh, 100% the speed at which the world's changing. How can anyone plan right now when like the whole world is flat, right? Anyone can start a business with nothing. And then the technologies underlying can be changed in a heartbeat and the market can go COVID or can go anti-COVID. I mean, Mm -hmm. like, I feel like you used to be able to like give yourself three to five years, you know, and just know that things would stay somewhat stable. But the businesses right now, if it's in technology and stuff, like it's just so hard to know where the the culture and environment are going to be in just a few years and what sentiment it's going to, I've seen so many businesses that have been upset because Facebook changed their algorithm and boom, their ads are gone. Now I have to change everything yep. or this thing hit or that thing hit, or they got canceled because of a political you know, sentiment throughout the nation. This is just like, there are so many more landmines that it's almost too daunting. So easy, so even though it's so easy now to, you know, money's cheap and it's somewhat, you know, a lot of the barriers to entry are not there that used to be there. It's harder than ever probably to actually start and succeed on doing a business. Because of all the landmines you have to navigate. Yeah. It's just like, who wants that in their life right now? Like who, yeah. who, who doesn't already have enough personal landmines to deal with and just being a human and yeah. navigating their own like families and and their day job why would you want to go on top of that and go like start a business that's uh yeah. it's it's glorious <laughs> it can be glorious and it's, not, it's just not for everyone and uh yeah yeah 
So, so for our last question here, Scott, and I feel like it's going to be very different from everybody else's that we've ever asked, just because you're so, uh, you're so against the grain, which I, I absolutely love. I literally, I will think about that story of you walking up to random, super successful people, just asking them to have lunch while looking like a nighttime. homeless man. And, and, and it was at nighttime. So it was, a di- it was dinner. So they were, that's why it was, they were scared because they couldn't really see me. I was a shadowy figure. <laughs> <laughs> and that now you're like best friends and they're like big investors with you. Like this story is just resonant. I don't, I feel like this story is just incredibly awesome, but I want to know what type of like last closing advice would you give to our listeners who are, who are like really early founders? What, what advice would you give them? You've seen success. You've seen failure. What would you tell them if they came to you and be like, Scott, tell me one thing that would make me be successful. And I know there's not one thing, but I'm curious on what, what you would say. I have, I, have an, I have a board member and a friend. His name is Mark Newman, and he is, he's the CEO of Nomi Health. He's, he started, started a company called Higher View you know, years ago. And I've watched his, how he does things. And this is, the, this is, this is one thing that I, I think is, is true. I think it's almost scientific. And it's the speed at which you make decisions. And I, I hear a lot of people saying, when this hits, I'll make that decision. I'll hire this person. When this thing happens in the future, I'll do X. And then my thing is, I say, do X now, do X now, hire that person today, do that thing today, start that thing. Like if you have something that is, uh, that you're putting off that's in the future, I would say execute on it today. And the reason being is we have a short time down here and people who execute on decision-making it's, it's like a baseball game and you get, but there's no, there's no batting, batting line. Like there's like, right now it's like, you have to wait and you're the fourth batter. In today's world, you can bat every second. You can be at bat, literally making decisions or trying to hit something out of the park or make a base hit every day. You're faced with uh, an A-B situation. And I've seen people who hesitate and put things off and, and, and categorize and put it out for later. And they make the decision. And, they, and so they, what they're doing is they're postponing decision-making and execution. And I would say that the best thing you can do is like be at bat every hour and make as many decisions as possible and what I've seen with Mark Newman is he was able to do something where he built a, almost a billion dollar company within a year and a half, um, his new health company. And he was able to do that because of the speed at which he made decisions and how many decisions he had. He can live a life with what a normal person can do in 10 years to 20 years, he can do in a year. So it's almost as if you time travel or you skip, you, you watch, it's like watching a podcast or Netflix or a podcast in 2x speed. If the rate that you can make decisions and execute, and, and execution doesn't mean like you have to hit a hammer and a nail. Execution can be just responding quickly to any email, any SMS, any question coming to you. Even here right now, I could have made a decision not to come on your podcast because I don't have time. I really don't. But I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it. Put it on a calendar. I'm not going to be set up or anything. You've seen my kids make me pasta and run around. I knew that if I did this, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be in an environment that would really help. I'm like, I'm going to make the decision because something serendipitous will come out of it. You have 4,000 viewers or listeners. One of them will reach out to me and I'll probably find a startup opportunity. That's amazing from this podcast because one of your listeners uh, has something for me and they'll hear and it'll resonate what I said. They'll have an idea that wants to change the world. They'll be able to solve that robot folding machine. And I'll combine that person with Dre and we'll make a trillion dollar empire. That is how the world works. And I can't get there unless I'm always making decisions every hour and not postponing those decisions. So if you have something you want to do, just go do it today. Don't, don't think it has happened in five years. Do it. Do that every single day. Don't wait for permission. You're don't in wait a, for permission. You're, yeah, don't wait for permission, permission. You're in a simulator anyway. And the whole game is to make as many uh, decisions before you die. That's the, that is the only game we know for sure. <laughs> Experiences, do as much as you can before the, sim, yeah. the simulator is over. So. I vibe so much with this. That's uh, that's funny because I feel like I'm like literally always preaching the same thing. So that's hilarious. Cool. Well, thanks cool. Scott for for jumping on with us. Um, we had a lot of fun, and um, I don't know. I feel like the, we talked about a lot of really interesting stories. So I'm I'm just gonna go dress up like a homeless man and walk around Salt Lake City, see if I can't build some good connections. That's what I'm gonna do now. So <laughs> something will happen, but the truth will be is that you don't know what that will do. You know, you more or less know what happens if you stay at home and work in front of your computer and push out emails. It's pretty predictable. But if you get into your car, go down to Pioneer Park, 
and start talking to random people and break out of any mold, you'll create chaos and out of chaos comes greatness. So go try it. <laughs> Love it. Love it.